Let me introduce and also invite our Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at this campus, the Senior Administrator in Charge of Advancing the University of Massachusetts Boston's Academic Mission and the Quality of its Intellectual Life, Dr. Winston Lally. and the personal and the national and the international wisdom and the insight has been a great resource and support to our Confucius Institute to be born and to have its strategic development in the future and now. Now and in the future. Let's welcome Winston. Thanks to the Confucius Institute and to Mrs. Bai Fung San, to Professor Xiang Go, to our Consul General who is with us today, Mr. Chang Kuang Sheng, and uh, we have a visitor who is. Uh, Dr. Chen Yun Lu, who is Deputy President of Renmin University, and we have our good dean of university college who has spoke on her behalf. Good afternoon to all. I am very pleased to be among you, especially so because it is the time of the seventh annual high school student Chinese Bridge speech contest. These events have always been inspirational. They've always been about students and their families, friends, well wishes, and teachers engaged in the study of Chinese language and culture. But also about human possibilities and the central challenge of this century. That challenge has to do with whether, as human beings, we can come to live together as one, given our cultural differences, as we evolve into the consciousness of an emerging single global society, and our single country, the planet Earth. Language and culture are fundamental to this enterprise. Since this cultural challenge is the challenge of human beings, it is, by definition, a universal challenge in which schools, colleges, universities are deeply implicated. The challenge is also about the future relations between two great countries, China and the United States. You, as teachers, as students, as families, as well-wishers, are therefore involved in many important adventures, not the least of which is the relationship between both countries, relations which will determine the future for a long time to come. For example, our country, the planet Earth, is under great stress in the form of climate change, increasing unavailability of water, desertification, pollution, deforestation, loss of biotic diversity, poor health care, poor housing, poor sanitation, nuclear weapons proliferation, among others. The banking and commercial regimes of the world are out of control. Europe, which seemed to have been on its way to unification, is being threatened by disintegration. Ethnic, racial, linguistic, and religious differences undermine intra- and inter-societal unity. And the institutions of the world, that is the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, 
the United Nations itself are incapable of responding adequately. None of the problems touched on above can properly be addressed without effective collaboration between the United States and China. I would like to suggest that there is enough that is common between the two countries to ensure a long-term friendship, especially if that friendship were based on a sound understanding grounded in language and culture. We have but to look at the continental size of each country, their ethic for hard work, their colonial experiences, their revolutionary backgrounds, their civil wars, their admiration for each other's culture, their commitment to what I call pragmatism, their search for alternative models of development. Both the U.S. and China exude a sense of power from the mere physical presence they embody. 3.6 million square miles for the U.S., 3.7 or 3.8, depending on your calculation, for China. These are huge. These are continental countries. Both believe and embody the ethic of hard work. Both underwent colonial experiences, although slightly different. With some of the brutalities of that experience, inviting a strong commitment to preserve their independence and territorial integrity. Both boast revolutions, which at the time of their taking place were the most radical. For the US, it was a middle class effort against an aristocracy supporting of monarchy, the monarchies of the day. For China, it was largely a peasant led effort, seen then as quite radical. Then we are sufficiently suspicious of political and legal institutions. That is, once you have a radical revolution, always suspicious of institutions that are going to confine one. And so the U.S. spoke in terms of, at least the Jefferson did, a permanent revolution. Mao Zedong spoke of a permanent revolution. Both suffer from a bloody civil war that still has its impact on their respective countries in the world. And both have pursued a philosophy of pragmatism found in the work of Confucius and John Dewey. Perhaps the most telling similarity between both societies is their respective efforts to create a socio-economic order of development that is different from those around them. Therefore, there is a basis for understanding. The idea of espousing a different model makes people of each country very curious about each other. Your efforts in language and culture goes to the soul of a society, the basis on which a sort of intuitive understanding can come to be. And only that intuitive level of understanding can enable us to truly grapple with differences between and among people. You are therefore our future leaders, people on whose shoulders shall be placed some of the prospects of relations between Washington and Beijing, of dealing with some of the stresses on the planet Earth, and of responding to the nature of individual and human development. This research university, the University of Massachusetts Boston, which is supposed to help us gain an understanding of new knowledge about human possibilities, is proud to host this contest. We say welcome to you and to the work of our common future. Congratulations to the 24 finalists which come to us from 11 states.
Thank you.